All right, so today's program is Dementia, Using Technology to Facilitate Aging in Place. So Dr. Nofel is going to talk about the Briere Memory Program, which is here in Ottawa, and the potential for smart sensors to identify changes in how people move and think as they get older, to learn patterns and intervene if needed. Dr. Frank Nofel is a physician at the Briere Memory Program in Ottawa and senior investigator at the Briere Research Institute. He holds appointments in the Department of Family Medicine, University of Ottawa, and Systems and Computer Engineering, Carleton University. Frank also has extensive administrative experience, including being medical doctor, chief of medical staff, and vice president. His research interests are focused on the use of sensors to facilitate aging in place. He's co-founder of the Taffeta Program of Research and the AgeWell National Innovation Hub, SAM3. After spending many years working on bed-based sensors to monitor physical well-being, such as transfers out of bed and breathing, Frank's work is now focused more on cognition. Sensors in the home can monitor activities of daily living, and soon artificial intelligence will be able to help cue a person. Similar, similarly, cognitive decline can affect driving ability, and the team is studying how technology can help assess and improve driving safely in older drivers. Frank is fortunate to be married to Kimberly and have two amazing daughters, Ariana and Karina. He enjoys wildlife photography, sailing, and snowboarding. And now that I've touted all of the amazing things, I didn't go through all your credentials. You can go ahead and do that if you want to. I'm going to pop in here and spotlight Dr. Nofel and check out myself and Dr. Nofel, whenever you're ready, you're good to go. And then we'll do the share screen if you're ready for that. Let me know if you need any help. We'll be here in the background. Great. Well, thank you very much, Tracy, for that uh, kind introduction. And uh, thank you uh, for inviting me to speak today about uh, two things that I'm very passionate about, um, care for people with cognitive impairment and uh, uh, technology. So, uh, I'm trying to share my screen and I have the same problem as I did earlier. It says that I am not able to share my screen. All right, give me a minute. We'll see what I can do to fix that up for you. Hang on. See if that allows you to do it. Okay, yes. It looks Perfect. like we're through, and uh, how's that? Uh, can we see the uh, slides? Everything looks great. You're all set. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. All right. So uh, here's the outline uh, for this afternoon's presentation. So I'm going to begin by talking a little bit about what dementia is. Um, then I'm going to give what I call a little technology primer, just to talk about uh, how I see technology. Then we'll go into how uh, we can use technology to help with diagnosis and cognitive monitoring. Uh, then we'll look at monitoring activities of daily living using technology. Um, then we'll explore can we use technology uh, in uh, cases of more advanced dementia we're wondering be a problem. Uh, finally, I'll do a quick survey of the kinds of technology that you could buy tomorrow if you were interested in doing that. And uh, finally, I'll wrap it all up. So um, I don't work by myself. I have a huge team uh, that uh, supports the work I do. In particular, my partner is uh, Rafiq Gubran, who is uh, Vice President of Research and International at uh, Carleton University. Um, Bruce Wallace uh, used to be at Nortel, then did a PhD with us and stayed on to help us. Uh, Heidi Streistrup is Vice President of Research here at Briere. You see many collaborators, students, um, people who have helped with administration and then paid research assistants as well. Um, it takes a village. Um, this is an aerial view of Carleton University and the engineering department where our labs are located are there. Um, and this is really the birthplace of the technology we've worked with. Uh, we begin with an idea. Uh, we look at what's uh, available in the real world. Um, if there's things we can use, we order them and send them there to Carleton and the, the students there take them apart and, and work with them in the first step. 
once we have a working prototype of something, then we bring it to Briere. And here, this is the Elizabeth Briere campus uh, near the market, uh, where, where I'm calling from right now, talking from right now. And there you see on the fourth floor where we have our uh, smart apartment, our suite, uh, where we actually test technology with uh, um, older adults. And this is what our smart apartment looks like. Um, it looks like a pretty ordinary uh, apartment. Um, you might notice here on the windowsill a couple of smart speakers. Uh, we do have Google Home, we have Alexa, uh, we have a Sonos speaker. The television here is actually connected to a computer system um, so we can remind people to take their blood pressure and uh, to take their weight. Uh, the bed looks pretty simple except for the little computer monitor that gives away that there's actually a pressure sensitive mat underneath the mattress. If you look very carefully, you see little, little white bubbles hanging underneath the different uh, cupboards. These are on off switches in, in the, the kitchen for monitoring use um, and the like. And uh, of course, AgeWell has been a big sponsor of our research. Uh, AgeWell is a national center of excellence and we've been working since uh, 2015 and extended now to 2022 um, for the research. Okay, so what is dementia? So being a physician, I always think about this with real people in mind. So this is a fabricated uh, case, but it's certainly the reality we deal with a lot. So we have a 78 year old lady living alone in a bungalow in Orleans. Uh, her daughter lives in Montreal and she's noticed some memory problems and also that her mom is having some difficulty managing the finances. So she's referred to the memory clinic. Um, we do some testing and we find that she has a diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment, but that we feel she's uh, transitioning to early dementia. Um, she wants to absolutely remain living in her home, but of course her daughter lives far away um, and uh, she had the uh, home care resources are stretched and, and hard to come by. So, so here, this is a real life problem. So let's just go back and talk a little bit about dementia. Um, so what happens, what we believe happens is that neurons um, become sick. Um, they become sick uh, through various uh, conditions and ultimately die. And what that does, it affects the brain circuits. So just like the cartoon depicts, if we have enough uh, little potholes, if you like, in our brain, in the circuitry in our brain, um, if there's enough of them, it's going to slow down the traffic or the communication in our brain, uh, just like the cartoon depicts. And if we have enough of that, ultimately, our ability to do things day to day, uh, our functioning will deteriorate. So uh, Dr. Alois Alzheimer in 1906 described um, the brain of a patient um, that he was caring for and uh, did this kind of an image and found two particular things that seemed to be unusual in this brain. One was amyloid plaques, the others were tau tangles. And since that time, um, we have used still these markers as a sign of um, uh, memory problems that are associated with uh, the Alzheimer's type of dementia. Even earlier, Arnold Pick had identified uh, inclusion bodies, um, and uh, they still uh, are included in the diagnosis of what's called Pick's disease, or now we talk about frontal temporal dementia, where people have difficulties with language and behavioral issues in particular that are the features of that type of dementia. Friedrich uh, Louis in uh, 1912 uh, identified uh, Louis bodies and uh, uh, Louis body dementia type, of course, is a type of dementia that involves visual hallucinations. Um, and uh, particular features of Parkinsonism with difficulty moving. Um, and finally, the, the, one of the more common types of dementia is associated with vascular damage. So 
if you uh, look here, we have sort of vessels that are feeding uh, different parts of the brain. And you see this vessel here, we've sort of cut it away to show that there's a clot. So that means that there's no blood flow coming up through this artery here. And this part of the brain is not going to be fed well. So if this brain part was responsible, for instance, for fine movement, then those movements now would not be as healthy as before. Um, obviously different parts of the brain do different things and you can see how vascular damage could hurt uh, really any part of brain functioning. So again, brain cells get sick. Could it be Alzheimer's disease? Could it be PICS? Could it be Lewy bodies? It could be vascular issues, but ultimately they get sick. The brain circuits are impaired and function deteriorates. So this slide is one of the more important slides and it answers the question of, um, you know, dementia, how does it relate to normal aging um, and mild cognitive impairment? So um, here I'm showing that really normal aging overlaps with mild cognitive impairment and that overlaps with uh, dementia. So aging um, we do lose our brain cells after the age of 29. That's when we have our highest number of brain cells. Subsequently, we lose brain cells year over year. And ultimately, it will affect our ability to remember. So the memory, it'll affect language and executive functioning abilities. Aging, though, is usually not associated with changes in our ability to manage instrumental activities of daily living. So instrumental activities of daily living would include going to the bank, uh, making a meal, uh, doing shopping in advance of making a meal, um, and that kind of thing, those uh, higher order functions of daily living. Now in mild cognitive impairment, there's enough change in memory or language or executive functioning that an average person can tell and go, yeah, that seems to be a little worse than just aging. And when we test these people, indeed, we find that the, the cognitive abilities are uh, more impaired uh, than normal aging would suggest. However, instrumental activities of daily living are still maintained. So let's say I have a significant memory problem, um, but I have to pay my bills. Now, I know I can no longer rely on just remembering uh, if I paid my bill or not. So now I uh, have to write down on the bill once I've paid it and the date, just so that if later I see that bill again and I can't remember if I paid because I've written on it, um, it's, uh, it's done. So a significant change in cognition, but still no change really in instrumental activities of daily living. And of course, dementia then is changes in memory that spill over into language and executive function or difficulties in language that ultimately spill over into memory and executive functioning. And of course, now instrumental activities of daily living are impaired. I forget how to pay bills. I forget if I've paid bills. Um, I forget how to make a complicated meal that requires different parts to start at different times so that the meal is all warm at the right time. And ultimately, I even forget basic activities of daily living. I forget to brush my hair, to shave, to shower, um, to change my clothes and the like. So the, initially everyone ages. We, we all will age, um, but then if there's more brain cell damage than normal, then um, we may be pushed over into mild cognitive impairment. There are other things other than brain cell damage, however, that can push us into mild cognitive impairment, such as depression. If we're depressed and we don't feel like doing things, it could look like we have cognitive uh, challenges, um, but it may in fact only be a, a depression. So then if we treat the depression, we can actually get back into what would be called normal aging into that group of people. However, if it really is damage, um, then that's more likely to be irreversible. And over time, that will progress um, to uh, dementia. So we start in aging, 
we progress over time to mild cognitive impairment and ultimately a dementia. Um, and then we can talk about mild cognitive impairment of Alzheimer's type if that's the change that's causing us to go from aging to mild cognitive impairment. And we can go from mild cognitive impairment to dementia of Lewy body type if that's the cause of the damage, right? So Alzheimer's is the cause that we're moving this way. Dementia is this degree of severity of our impairment. So we have symptoms. We get eventually diagnosed. We're monitored. As we get monitored over time, the diagnosis may change from mild cognitive impairment to dementia. There is functional decline and we can monitor that. And in real life, what's happening to us is that we may be living at home. Then we need uh, services to support us as things deteriorate. We may need to move to a retirement home. We may ultimately end up in long-term care. So the question of course is today is what can technology do um, either on this side, which is sort of the monitoring, diagnosing, um, and ultimately, you know, what could technology do to delay um, movement down the line on the right? So um, we're now going to move on a little bit to technology. So for me, the way I think about technology and aging, first we need some kind of device, a sensor, that um, is going to provide us with information. So uh, we can have something as simple as a wall mounted infrared sensor. That would be like a, a, the kind of sensor you might have had in your home even 10 years ago. That's a, a part of an alarm function. And uh, this can cost as little as uh, $5 for a sensor like that. Then you might have a bed pressure sensor. This can be as little as $20, but can cost as much as $1,000, depending on how many sensors there are and, uh, and, and what kind of, of activity you want to me measure. Uh, a camera is a sensor, right, because it takes images and uh, they're stored um, and uh, we can use it for pleasure, but we can also use it um, uh, for, for, for functional measurement. And finally, GPS in a car we use it, the map side of things usually, but of course there is a function of identifying where the GPS is at any given time. So the sensors collect data. So a wall mounted infrared sensor simply measures motion. Is there motion in the room or not? Um, and it will simply say no motion, no motion, no motion until there is motion, then it'll say motion, motion until there isn't any more. And then there's no motion, no motion. So that's it. Simply yes or no is there motion. A bed pressure sensor, however, can give a lot of numeric data. So there might be one, there might be a hundred points on a pressure sensor like this that provides a pressure value um, for every uh, fraction of a second. So one of the sensors we use has 24 sensors and they're sampled uh, 10 or 20 times a second. And each of those 24 points then gives a number, a pressure, either a low number, meaning there's very little pressure on it, or a high number, suggesting there's a lot of pressure on that sensor. Uh, as I said, cameras produce images and GPS ultimately uh, produces a location. So now um, we need to interpret that data. So if it's a um, wall mounted motion sensor, um, we can say that there's someone in the room because there's motion. Now it, it could be a person, it could be an animal, um, it could be a curtain that's blowing in the wind. But the assumption is if we've aimed the sensor right, if it's at the right height, um, we can pretty well narrow down that it's someone in the room. If it's a bed pressure sensor, we could say, is someone in bed or not? Because the pressure obviously will be very different if they are. But a good pressure sensor with multiple and very sensitive um, uh, sensors could even detect breathing. So the pressure goes up and down as our chest wall moves and we're actually breathing. 
a camera could show someone walking and could show someone falling. And a GPS device, as I said, certainly can give location. But if it says a minute ago you were here, now you're here, we know how far you've traveled, we can measure speed, um, and we can say, are you moving, are you stopped? So that's the interpretation of the data that's been collected. Now finally, a really smart system will be able to produce an action based on the interpretation of the data. So a wall mounted sensor that detects that someone is in the room could turn on the light. And that would be a useful function. A bed sensor that identifies that someone has left the bed in the middle of the night um, that may be at risk of wandering, you might notify the nurse in the long-term care facility, for instance. A camera that has detected a fall might notify a family member to check in on their loved one. And a fancy GPS device that knows location and that has been preset that the vehicle is not supposed to leave the greater Ottawa area if the car starts moving down Highway 417 towards uh, Montreal might actually cut off the power in the vehicle to prevent it from uh, leaving the city. So you have a sensor, you have data that comes out of the sensor, you interpret that data, and then you might be able to generate an action for a really smart system. So let's talk about diagnosis and cognitive monitoring. And uh, so I'm going to show you um, a graph. It's, it looks a little complicated, but it's actually not that bad. So the graph shows function and it could be cognitive function. It could be a memory test that you apply or something like that. Or, um, and then it shows over time measurements of this function. So here we have the results of, we'll call this the red person. And you can see that day to day, there are some fluctuations in the score that this person scores. So let's say this was a MOCA test. So they might score um, 28, 27, 28, 26, 28, 27, 29, 30, right? And, and that gives you an idea if we were testing every single day, what it might look like. On the other hand, we have this blue person who um, is the same, we're measuring the same sort of thing, but over time, you can see there's a bit of a drift down. Now, in reality, I can only see patients once every six months or sometimes once every year. So let's put on these graphs some random points. So let's say the very first time I see this person at baseline, this is their score. And then I see them a year later, and this is their score. And then a year later, this is their score. So it looks like this person is deteriorating over time, according to these three spots. But of course, if we were to have more data and we were able to do an average, we'd be able to determine that this person actually was quite stable over time. Now let's look at the blue person. And here we have the baseline data. A year later, I see this patient again, and their score looks pretty much the same as it was before. Um, and then I see them two years later, and again, the score is pretty much the same it looks like this person really has not changed over time. But of course, if we look at their average score, we see that there has been a significant decline for the person. Hence, technology would be able to give us more data and hopefully improve our accuracy. So I'm gonna give you an example. Um, um, I'm gonna give you many examples of research that we have done. Um, and, but these are just samples and uh, just so that you can see how we think about using technology and now we're in the domain uh, of diagnosis, right? So here's a game on the computer, it's called Cognigram and essentially this part of the test measures 
speed of processing. So as soon as the card turns over and you see the joker, you click on yes, and we measure the time delay. Then it gets a little bit more complicated. Now the question is, is the card red? And in this case, of course, it's a red joker, so we'd press on yes. If it was a black joker, we'd press on no. So now it's more complicated. We can answer how many times did you get it right and how fast were you at this new additional piece of information. And this is real data from patients that have been uh, seen by us here at Briere. And we took a group of normal, cognitively normal older adults, and then we took some people with mild cognitive impairment, so the, the little circle right beside, right? And we did these tests with them, and you can see that consistently, the people with mild cognitive impairment score below the cognitively normal group. So theoretically, um, and this is the work that still needs to be done, um, a low score on this game, computer-based game, if you like, um, would be able to help us determine if this is someone who's cognitively normal or has mild cognitive impairment. We also have done research with um, EEG. And uh, so here you see the cap with the electrodes on it. And uh, so we take all the electrodes and we get electronic signals coming out of that because of course the brain works through electricity, as I said earlier. And then we analyze the data and sometimes we use NeuroCatch, sometimes we use our own algorithms. But here you see um, one component of brain waves that we can extract from, uh, uh, from an ERP, and this is the N100. And you can see in black the normal person, and then you can see in the dotted red line someone with mild cognitive impairment. And you can see that the bottom of the curve, which is the point of the N100, happens sooner for the cognitively normal person than the person with mild cognitive impairment. So if we go again with our example of potholes on the highway, um, the person with mild cognitive impairment has more potholes to evade, so it takes them longer to get to the same place than it does for someone who's cognitively normal. So their brain is working because there's fewer potholes. This is slower because of more potholes. Um, then um, now I'm going to talk about uh, another uh, type of game that we designed, uh, that we were involved in designing and testing, and it's called Whack-A-Mole, which many of you know. And this is uh, something we use in people with more advanced dementia. And of course, playing a game is, produces less stress than being in front of me and me doing cognitive testing. Games are advantageous as well because education does not seem to impact them as much as tests based on language. And of course, people can take this home wherever they live, in rural areas, wherever. You don't have to be in Ottawa to be able to do this, and yet I can monitor um, your progression. So this is the screen, very much like a whack-a-mole game. Every time a mole pops up, we whack them, touch the screen, um, and in this one we've added a bunny, um, and the bunnies are our friends, so we don't whack the bunny. So it's uh, four times out of five, we'll get a mole popping up and then every randomly, every now and then we'll get a bunny that we don't wanna hit. So we measure speed of processing and inhibition and there's levels in the game. And here we're taking people that are at a day program, um, dementia day program, so diagnosed with dementia and then uh, um, cognitively impaired enough that uh, the caregiver needs some respite, right? Um, and we took people, um, two groups, uh, the people with low MMSE scores, meaning more significant cognitive impairment and higher MMSE scores. And you can see here at baseline, there's a big difference in the speed with which they play the game. And even over 10 weeks, you can see that the groups stay very separate, very distinct. Um, and but you can see over time that they do get better. Surprisingly, even the more impaired group um, over here in the light green improves over time, but just not as much as the uh, uh, less impaired group. So we can monitor cognition over time. 
Um, we're trying to see, can we use technology to help us diagnose and we can monitor it over time. So what about activities of daily living? Because that's really the most important uh, thing uh, to live independently is can we do things uh, by ourselves? So here's a gizmo that we created in 2012 and you can see it's wired because in 2012 there was no wireless, right? Now we take wireless for granted, but in those days we didn't have it. So here's a little switch on the fridge door and up here we have a box and the box has a small computer and a big loudspeaker. And what we did is every time you open the fridge door after a minute, it would say the fridge door is still open. So we sold it to older adults saying, this is just a reminder, the door is open. If you get distracted and you forget to close it, you won't spoil your milk. Um, of course, behind the scenes, I was more interested in how often is the fridge door being opened and to, to see if I could develop patterns. And then if that pattern were to be disrupted, we could say that something is going on in the well-being of this person um, because they're not hungry, they're not eating um, be as before. So here you see a graph of a real person that we collected data from, and it simply maps the number of times the fridge was opened at various times of the day. And not surprising, before nine o'clock in the morning, there was breakfast. Around noon, we had lunch. And then somewhere between four and 5.30, there was supper. There was also a little snack in the afternoon and a little snack before bedtime. So this is the pattern we would sort of a normal trimodal pattern, you know, three meals a day. And if this was, you know, broken on a continuous basis, we would think that would be a marker of change. Now, this is the type of research we're doing now. We've gone from one sensor to multiple sensors. This is in partnership with a group in the US. And uh, now we have a wearable device that gives us an idea of what is the person doing. We can weigh them. We can monitor their taking of medication with a smart pill box. Um, we're monitoring computer activity, doors opening and closing. And we even have, in some cases, a sensor in the car that monitors driving. And so in driving, uh, we've done work uh, looking at distance travel, which is only one dimension. Um, and here what we did is we looked at the health of the driver um, and we did both cognitive and physical health. And then we looked at distance from home. And you see that the red drivers, which are less well, spend the large, large majority of their time driving between zero and 20 kilometers. And the healthy drivers, have blips at 40, 50, 100, 200 kilometers, which I think is Montreal, and then 400 kilometers, which is uh, Toronto, right? So healthy drivers are more likely to travel far than uh, not so healthy drivers. So again, using a sensor um, to monitor activities of daily living, and driving is an instrumental activity of daily living, as is making meals uh, and the like. So now um, we've talked about some of the sensing for diagnosing, some of the monitoring activities of daily living, all of which are really measuring um, change. And, and they're helpful to me as a clinician to, to de determine if my treatment is working or if we've slowed the change, that kind of thing. But we still haven't fig figured out, or we still haven't shown a, a, a smart system. So um, we worked together with the uh, uh, Dementia Society of Ottawa, and, and we said, if we were able to build a system for you very quickly that included smart sensors and smart technology, what would be the most important thing for you? And they've said, wandering. The, the thing that most worries us about our partners or family members with living with dementia is wandering. As you can imagine, uh, heading out of the house in the middle of the night in the middle of winter um, can have tragic consequences uh, for the person with dementia. 
Um, the caregiver though, uh, especially if it's a partner and, and they're sleeping in the same bed, um, they worry about this and every time the bed moves, they wake up um, and they, they are awake until the person with dementia comes back to bed. So of course, if you're not sleeping well, you're stressed, you're not as good of a caregiver um, and the like. So we, uh, working with the Champlain Lynn and other partners, uh, got a set of sensors that we ordered online. So now we're not doing fancy research uh, about future work. This is real practical. So all of these sensors we bought um, online. Um, so here you have a door sensor, here you have motion sensors, and then here you have a smart plug and a smart bulb. This is the hub. This connects these sensors to the cloud, to the internet. And uh, our research assistant actually went into the home and installed door sensors, um, put a pressure sensor under the mat, and then used an iPad to program the devices so that they all work together. Um, and here's a smart speaker, the one we use uh, to communicate. So what does the system do? So let's say the person living with dementia wakes up in the middle of the night. Usually it's the bladder calling. Um, so getting out of bed, the light turns on in the hall and leads them to the bathroom. And they do their business and then hopefully they follow the light path back to bed. If they go back to bed, the system shuts down and everything is A-OK. -okay. Now let's say that they get distracted and decide to go to the kitchen. Now there's a motion sensor there and it's connected to the smart speaker and we use the voice usually of a family member or the partner and we say, you know, for instance, hello Peter, it's still nighttime, please come back to bed. So if they listen to that voice and go back to bed, again the system shuts down and everything goes back uh, to normal, to back to sleep. However, if they do go on to go to the front door, then of course it's a full on alarm. We can have a phone ringing, we can have the lights flashing, whatever, um, and, and this wakes the person with dementia. So first you have light that guides the person to where they need to go and hopefully back to bed. If that doesn't work, we use sound to guide them back to bed. And, and all of, throughout all of this, of course, the partner stays fast asleep. They don't need to be disturbed. And only if they go to the front door, they're woken. So here's data from a real person, and you can see August 31st. And the dark blue line is when they're in bed. So here, the person living with dementia goes to bed, and over here they get up. And you can see that there were that night, three times that they got out of bed. And if you look at these sensors that were firing, these are motion sensors, and they always were in the person uh, living with dementia, their bathroom. So they had a particular bathroom they went to, and you can see that all three times that night, they went to the bathroom and then back to bed uh, shortly after. Now, if you take the data, because we, this study lasted several months in each person's home, and if you take the data and plot it concentrically with every subsequent day being a new circle, a little bit like the tree, the circle on the tree, um, you can start seeing patterns. So we have midnight here, we have noon here, and then the different times of day and night. Now you can see that the person living with dementia, they have, they're not completely regular in the times they go to sleep, but typically on average, they sort of go to bed 9.30ish and they typically wake up nine-ish in the morning. They do stay in bed longer sometimes and they do occasionally get up earlier, but you know, it sort of gives you an average. And you can also see that typically, not always, but typically they've been to the bathroom the first time um, by uh, one o'clock in the morning. So in, in a particular case, uh, we, they did get up every single night. They went to the bathroom most of the time um, from five to 60 minutes. And uh, they did go to the kitchen once. Um, in this case, the 
partner, the wife had decided she didn't want to use her own voice. She said, look, he, ne he never listened to me when we were married. Why would he start listening to me now? Um, so we used Siri's voice and uh, the voice said, uh, you know, it's the middle of the night, go back to bed. <laughs> um, maybe not quite that sternly, but that only happened once. And he said, there was some lady and she told me to go back to bed. I, I'm never gonna go into the kitchen again during the night. <laughs> so there were no falls or injuries, no elopement. So that was the good outcome. They never, you know, they, the, the light guided them. Um, the voice guided them um, and there were no bad outcomes. Now, what about the person living with the person uh, with dementia? At the beginning of the trial, she said that uh, she scored, this is, these are standardized rating scales, depression, a moderate depression, because worry about, you know, when is he gonna leave in the middle of the night and that kind of thing. After the, the couple of months of the trial, uh, we redid the score and uh, she had dropped significantly to a normal well-being. So um, the technology, uh, monitoring dementia, uh, wandering in dementia actually seem to be working for both uh, people equally well. Um, so that's all I wanted to talk about our research and I did sort of a quick uh, flyover, but I did want to end uh, uh, with technology that's currently available um, and just talk a little bit about uh, the pros and cons of the different types of technology. So. Um, you all have probably seen the personal alerts that you can buy, uh, Philips uh, Lifeline, Red Dot here in Ottawa, um, a number of companies that monitor these devices. And uh, the idea is if you need help, you press the button and this calls a uh, call line and then they call the home and, and it, it speak through the phone to a, through a speaker system to see if you're okay or not and if you need help or not. Um, and this system is, is very good. Um, however, for people with the cognitive impairment, um, they may fall and panic and forget that they are wearing the device. So it's not always functional in people with cognitive impairment. Also people with cognitive impairment forget what the device is for and are more likely to take them off um, and because it's irritating them um, and so personal alerts are very good, um, but they do have caveats um, in uh, use. Uh, then of course, there's all kinds of cool things you can get for your smartphone. Um, you can get a reminder, a medication reminder. Um, you can get, you know, a calorie counter. And all of these are great tools for staying in shape, for remembering to take medication. But again, for people with cognitive impairment, they have a little bit less or more limited functionality because they do require you to learn um, new things. And smartphones are quite recent still, so that first you have to learn how to use the smartphone, and then you have to learn how to use the app. And of course, that can be um, challenging. There are, of course, lots of wearable sensors. Um, a typical device might measure the number of steps you take in a day. It might even re remind you to walk every hour or every half hour, depending on the setting. It might have a GPS function. It typically gives heart rate, maybe blood pressure. It might comment on your sleep quality. Um, it might be connected to a phone. And again, um, these are useful, um, but may or may not have a lot of meaning for someone with uh, dementia. Uh, smart TVs, so TVs are getting smarter. Now we can do emails, uh, we can connect to the internet, we can watch Netflix, we can do Skype calls with our TV, um, and we can do medication reminders that pop up on the TV uh, uh, while we're watching something else. We might have a reminder to take our weight um, or our blood pressure. There are, of course, smart lights. These are Philips that I've shown. They can be fun and give you different colors, different brightness. Of course, they can be activated by movement, as I talked about in our system. We can use sunlight to make, to make a gradual wake up so it gets gradually brighter over time. We can link it to music and that kind of thing. 
there are smart fridges. And again, just the smart lights in and of themselves are not necessarily uh, helpful for people with cognitive impairment. Uh, uh, smart fridge, uh, these are still quite expensive. Um, you can program in exp expiration dates. Uh, you can uh, check if the recipe you're trying to make, the ingredients are in the fridge. Uh, you can order food that you need automatically. Um, if you're shopping, you can use the camera feature to actually look inside the fridge and check. Uh, do I still have watermelon? Oh yeah, there's some watermelon there and some strawberries. So again, for people with dementia, might be helpful for expiration dates if we're gonna lose our milk, um, but uh, that's still pretty complicated. Then uh, I mentioned earlier smart mattress. Um, cool things like preheating the bed for sleep. It can give a sleep report uh, um, and it, some of them can do some kind of staging uh, as well. Again, for people with dementia themselves, maybe not helpful, but it could be useful for a family member to know how many times they got up at night uh, uh, or if they left for a couple of hours where they may not have been sleeping. There's communication devices. This is a previous version of Alexa. You can ask Alexa pretty much anything. What's the time, the date, what's the temperature today? What's the news? Can you play my favorite music? You can have uh, a book read through Alexa. You can call people um, and uh, you can answer questions and uh, the medication reminders are possible using this as well. And again, um, it does require a certain amount of cognitive ability because if you just say, what's the date today? Of course, nothing happens. You have to start by initiating Alexa. What's the date today? Um, and then finally, uh, the first professional grade system of home monitoring that I'm aware of that's been put out by industry is Best Buy Assured Living. Um, and this started in uh, BC and it's uh, become available, I believe, in Toronto and is coming to Ottawa in the not too uh, distant future, but they actually would install sensors in the home um, uh, to be able to monitor activities and you can get a daily report on um, what's happened uh, in the last 24 hours. So in the future, um, I see this kind of a world where you see uh, David is coming to get a beer. He speaks to his fridge and says, uh, Hal, um, get me another beer. Um, unfortunately, Hal is not uh, being cooperative and says, you know, because of information on the bathroom scale and uh, the hall mirror, they're, just, they're reporting disturbing flab anomalies Then there's no beer for today. So kind of a tongue-in-cheek um, smart appliance, um, you know, that's been programmed to take care of health. So, let's go back to our lady, 78-year-old um, lady living by herself in a bungalow, and uh, we're concerned about her living alone. So, what can we do today? Well, as of today, we could get her a set of games that she could play on a regular basis. And theoretically, we would be able to extract information about that game playing um, that would help a clinician uh, like us here at the Memory Clinic to be able to determine over time um, if she is really transitioning to dementia or not. We can monitor activities of daily living, such as how frequently are we uh, accessing the fridge? Um, that kind of thing uh, as well. Are we taking our medications regularly using a smart pill box? That kind of thing. And we can even provide a little bit of assistive functioning. Um, so if she forgets uh, what the, the activities of the day are, you know, if she remembers to ask Alexa, Alexa can go to her calendar and say at nine o'clock, um, you're going to have a doctor's appointment and uh, your, or your daughter's going to come pick you up and drive you to your doctor's appointment and the like. And of course, communication, um, various types of communication uh, facilities can be uh, installed. So 
the population is aging. Aging in place has always been what older adults preferred. Um, right now with uh, the COVID situation, uh, there's an increased uh, concern about going into communal living. Um, so the need for technology to monitor wellness and provide assistance is very, very uh, at appropriate. It's very, uh, it's, it's the time uh, for this kind of technology. Um, my team and I have been doing this for, for a number of years. Um, and the good news is that it's not only in the realm of research now, it's really becoming reality um, that's being uh, offered by uh, businesses uh, and uh, the like. So that's uh, all the formal presentation and I just another tongue in cheek kind of picture where uh, we have technology and uh, we see the lions have appreciated this uh, flying technology because it provides shade for them. So and with that, uh, I will end and uh, I'm happy to answer questions. Fantastic. That was a great presentation. Let me check in with my colleague, Stephen. He was looking after the Q&A. If anybody happens to have a question that they'd like to add to the Q&A now, please feel free to do that. Um, and we'll see if Dr. Nofel can answer those. Um, while I'm giving everyone a minute to do that, I have a question for you, actually. I'm wondering about um, the insoles for shoes that have GPS. Are you familiar with them? And do yes. you have any reviews or any information about those? Yes, so uh, that is actually a product that's offered with the Red Dot system here in Ottawa. And uh, um, I've watched the technology over time evolve. And uh, uh, so it, it seems like the GPS function on it, it works. Um, so. I have a couple of, I have actually never tested it in the lab. Uh, our group, we have never acquired that particular system. Um, my, my reservation is that um, it is still quite expensive as far as technology goes. Uh, the, my other concern is that very few people only wear one pair of shoes. And so if you have five pairs of shoes, um, are you gonna get five sets of sensors? Um, which, and, and then not all shoes are, are compatible. So um, the idea is, is a very original. I think it's great. I think that if we can extract information about um, gait at the same time, so not just where is this shoe, but also how long is the stride, um, and, you know, how symmetrical is the gait, um, if those functions were available, I think it would have additional value. But uh, but yeah, it's, it's certainly an interesting device. And uh, um, and if someone wants to get me a pair, I'm more than happy to <laughs> test them out in the lab. That's great. That's great feedback because I was looking at them actually. My father has Alzheimer's and it was something I was considering um, leaving just one pair of shoes near the door that they always use and putting those in. I think that that might have worked for him, but it's great to hear that you've got some information about them. I'm going to ask my colleague Stephen to um, open up here with his, are you there Stephen? Stephen's yeah, going to here. do the other questions with you. Yeah, there's, um, there's one here. Uh, can you discuss AI or robotics uh, can be used? Also, what about virtual reality? Okay, <laughs> yeah, those are those are great questions, uh, and they each require at least an hour uh, um, to answer pro properly. Well, so let's talk. Uh, let's start with AI. So artificial intelligence um, is really, um, if you go back to my sensor uh, picture or where I was doing the primer in technology, the artificial intelligence is really taking the information from the sensors and trying to make um, sense of them. So um, artificial intelligence would be the, what you use um, to, uh, for instance, say, um, where is the person in the middle of the night? The bed sensor says, I've gotten out of bed, but that doesn't mean we know where they've gone. So then you might say, well, there was a sensor triggered in the hall, there's a sensor triggered in the bathroom, um, then no other sensors have been triggered, so the AI would be the, the, the designing or the algorithms that 
decide, well, they're probably still in the bathroom. And if they're in the bathroom for, let's say, an hour, now we start worrying about why have they not left? And we might think that they've fallen. So AI is that ability to use the sensors and to make um, deductions and probabilities. Um, and then the AI should activate a function. So if someone is after an hour still in the bathroom and not likely sitting on the toilet, not likely showering, um, then uh, we need to notify the neighbor. So the AI would do all that, take the data, analyze it, make probabilistic decisions, and then notify the neighbor. So that's the AI side. Um, robotics. Well, robotics are interesting because they're devices in the home. So some people call Alexa a robot because you can talk to her, she can answer you. Um, but of course there are other robots like a vacuum cleaner is a robot. Um, and then there are robots you can interact with that look more humanoid, like that have a head and limbs. Um, and there are ones that move around. And so uh, certainly robotics is an interesting uh, technology as well. I don't have a lot of experience in robotics. That's not what I do. I do passive sensing and uh, intelligence based on activities of daily living. But um, robots can certainly interact with people. They can remind people to take their medications. Um, and so robots are a mobile um, interaction platform and, and the artificial intelligence can be built into the robot and then certainly they can be connected to the cloud. And, and they, so it's a different way of interacting uh, with the, the person. But yeah, robotics, there's a big, big, a lot of research happening there. It's just not my area. Uh, of expertise and uh, virtual reality, right? So virtual reality um, is what I would call more of an intervention. Um, so let's say that my set of sensors uh, monitored uh, mobility over time and we found that uh, the mobility um, was deteriorating. Um, so I would use virtual reality to design a rehabilitation program, let's say, um, and I would say that, well, because of the legs being weaker, um, let's do a set of exercises to strengthen the legs. And so I would use virtual reality to, um, to create a therapeutic program. People use virtual reality as well to test ability. Um, so you could do um, the whack-a-mole game in three dimensions, and, um, and certainly uh, that would be virtual reality for diagnostic purposes. But for me, I, I think more of virtual reality in the rehabilitation sphere. Um, and, uh, um, but you can test driving ability with virtual reality. You can do a lot of things. You can do, you can test instrumental activities of daily living in virtual reality as well. But, um, yeah, so virtual reality is another set of technologies um, that can be used uh, certainly and, and can be useful. And again, not one that I'm uh, using or terribly familiar with. So. Is that good for that uh, set of questions? Yeah, uh, I have I have another one here. Um, she said, thank you. The other one was more uh, this perhaps collaborating with you on a project. Uh, perhaps we could just pass along uh, um, my colleague's email uh, and we could, it, it was about a researcher from uh, North Africa who's working on a project. Oh, and, sure. Uh, yes, yeah, so it, it wasn't really you. within the realm of COVID. Sure, if they contact you or you want to forward an email to me, that would be great. Uh, we're always looking for collaborators. In fact, we're working with a number of European groups right now. So um, that, that, that we're definitely open to, to partnerships. Okay, all right. That, that's all the questions we have in the, in the chat, uh, in the Q&A area. So I see something in the chat box on the side. Uh, Digital apps are tricky. Seek some guidance with the Geek Squad at Best Buy stores. Uh, 
that was my reply okay, actually reply. yeah okay. there was there was someone that was um mentioning that the apps are really tricky especially for right. someone that is um older and not as accustomed to them um so i was suggesting maybe um seeking some support with something like geek squad at best buy and i also mentioned that places like the ottawa public library have tech courses um we're doing some online right now but of course then you have to be able to access them <laughs> using the internet so it is very very tricky um but do you have any suggestions on that kind of thing? So, no, I, so yeah, I mean, the, ob the observation is very, very good. And, and of course, the, the biggest challenge we have is that technology to design it is very complicated. And, and the trick is to make the technology um, super user friendly, right? So for instance, in our wandering detection uh, um, solution, there is no interface, right? There, the, the, the people in the home actually do not interact with the technology at all. Um, just by getting off the bed, the light goes on. Um, just by entering a room in the middle of the night, a room you're not supposed to be in, um, the technology will speak to you using your partner's voice saying, hey, it's the middle of the night, please go back to bed. So yes, we, you need the iPad to set it up, but it's actually part of the service. A little bit like the Geek, the Geek Squad will install the Best Buy home monitoring system. Um, and really, you don't do anything. Um, the only, uh, the, it's only when you want to interact with the system yourself. So let's say you want to check uh, um, your, how many times was I up last night? Uh, uh, then, then, you, then you would have to interact with the system, but a smart, really smart system would be connected to a smart speaker and you could say, hey Alexa, how many times did I get up last night? And, and, and she'd be able to give you that. So I'm not aware of, of that system existing yet, but certainly interfacing with the technology is, is a challenge. And, and really what we as our group has focused on is making it completely passive so that really you don't need to learn to do anything. You just live your life and the technology is there to support you. Excellent, that's great. I think that's, oh, no, there's one more that just popped up in the chat. Is there any technology that can assist a person with phone messages, someone that is with MCI? Uh -huh. <laughs> that's, uh, that's great. Um, I am not aware of, any technology in that way. The, the, uh, I mean, in some ways you could argue that the answering machine itself is already a smart system, right? Because you're not there to answer the phone and uh, so they leave the message and it's there. You can play it a hundred times and as long as you don't erase it, it's always there to be re-verified. I mean, obviously there's a limit to the number of messages you can keep, but it, so, so in a way, the technology, the, uh, the, the answering machine is already a technology for people with MCI, but to take it out of there, um, how to then, uh, if you delete the message, how to make sure that something has happened, um, I'm not sure uh, that's available. Again, it would require some kind of additional step. Now, um, if there was, you know, people with MCI work a lot with uh, sticky note reminders, for instance. So if you have a sticky note reminder beside the answering machine, which says, um, as soon as you listen to the message, write down uh, who called and their phone number, and you have a little pad right beside the answering machine and a big yellow sticky note saying, do not erase before writing the message, um, you know, you, that would be the kind of thing you do for someone with mild cognitive impairment because they can still uh, react to some, some cues. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure of a technology that's uh, available. I mean, you know, short of recording something somewhere else, but then you've already got the recording on the answer machine. I'm not sure that would be uh, uh, very, uh, very helpful. Um, a smartphone would also still have in its memory bank the last numbers that called. Um, so that's another way to sort of use that information and cross-reference. But yeah, it's a good question, um, but I'm not sure. Right, so the, okay, I see someone is saying, 
uh, that works with the answering machine, but what, is, what about if they answer the phone and, don't, and forget to take a message? Yeah, I don't have a solution for that. Again, it's, it's uh, a, for people with MCI, if you can have a notepad right beside the phone with a pen and, and a big yellow sticky, please write down as soon as someone talks to you, um, you know, that's the best we can do. If they forget with a pad and a pen and a sticky note to record the message, then I have to start wondering if we're not a little bit more impaired than, um, than mild cognitive impairment. There is, there is one more question in the Q&A. Uh, is there not a security issue with using Alexa? Does it not record all kinds of information it hears? Excellent question. So the whole question of privacy is, is huge, right? Um, the, you know, we collected uh, information about people's homes, what they were doing at night um, for several months, uh, 20 people in Ottawa, and all that information went into the cloud. And theoretically, um, someone could hack into the cloud and, and take all that information. So the, and of course, the, the level of privacy changes. Um, and so our sensors, the interesting thing was that each sensor had a unique number, a little bit like a car maybe has a unique license plate or a unique VIN number. Um, and all that went to the cloud was a timestamp and yes or no, on or off, right? So, so these sensors are, are, motion, are motion sensors, so motion or not, but you didn't even know if it was a motion sensor. So all this information went to the cloud. Even if someone hacked in, they would not have been able to put together the information to know what was really going on in that home. So when we design the technology and when we design the way of analyzing it, of course, we have to take into consideration privacy issues. Um, if you, in, if you, you're absolutely right. Alexa is always on, and there's always information that's being recorded. Um, and so, if you can hack into Alexa, hypothetically, you could hear what people are saying. However, trust me, we've tried it. It's extremely difficult to hack into Alexa. It's, uh, it's very, very robust security. Now the people working at Amazon, do they have access to this? They absolutely do. But think about the hundreds of millions of Alexa devices that are recording continuously, and then the probability that someone is actually going to want to find one particular message in one particular home, it, it's kind of unlikely, but yes, there are privacy issues and, and each company has to deal with them. Obviously video, streaming video online provides a lot more information uh, than individual sensors that are only identified with uh, uh, a, a, a numeric code. So um, absolutely, the way you collect data, the way you transmit data, where the data goes and how you analyze it all requires uh, confidentiality. And of course, researchers that work in our lab, we know which house we put the sensors in. No one else does, but we do. So we, uh, we all sign confidentiality uh, agreements and all of the students that work and all the staff that work with us, they know um, that they can you know, never divulge any kind of this information. They work on it for research purposes only. But yes, absolutely, we, um, we need to think about that. Now, on the up flip side, um, there's Facebook, right? And what people put on Facebook um, so defies logic and privacy and personal discretion that, you know, um, that if I have the choice of having to go to a nursing home or having information from a few sensors in my home going to the cloud, be analyzed, and then connect to my daughter, um, and that gives me a couple of more years at home you know, that might be technology that I would choose uh, and even pay for knowing that I've exchanged a little bit of privacy for a lot of autonomy and staying at home. 
but it's that's a great a, question. Yeah, that's a really great explanation even. Um, I think that um, one of the concerns that keeps coming up in the Q&A in the chat is how can we possibly expect someone who has cognitive impairment or dementia um, how can we expect them to even be able to manage with this test technology? And I think what you're getting at right there even is that it isn't necessarily the person that has mild cognitive impairment or dementia that is the one that needs to understand all the technology, but rather the technology is in place so that someone, a care partner, um, can help to sort of establish what is needed by that person. Is that correct? Am I reading that right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, the, the, the whole purpose of this technology is to provide information and support for the person with dementia. And I'm not saying we, we don't want the, the person with dementia to be able to access that, but it will require a big effort on their part. But you're absolutely right. It's more about the care partners, the family members, uh, care providers, professional care providers, myself as a clinician, if I had this continuous game playing data, I, I would rely on it more than I would my memory test on Tuesday morning at nine, knowing that, you know, that the cognition fluctuates and I may have gotten the worst or the best part of the day, um, which is arbitrary and doesn't give me the real, uh, necessarily the real, the real ability. So uh, absolutely, um, the, uh, you know, the, we're assuming that the daughter that wants to access this information has a smartphone, can log in, and can access information about her mom. You know, how was her day? Did she eat today? Did she open the fridge? Did she turn on the stove? Um, and and uh, um, that that's the support we can provide. And if that's not working anymore, then we get Meals on Wheels, right? And we design the care support for the person with dementia. Um, my assumption is not that we're teaching people that have cognitive impairment a whole bunch of new things. That's, that's not very realistic. Amazing. Thank you so much for such a great presentation. Um, someone mentioned in the chat that you really make um, dementia make sense, that you actually um, speak very well about it and obviously make it make sense. That's years of experience. <laughs> Um, so it's just so wonderful that you were able to share this with us. I'm personally very happy that I don't have a smart fridge in my home right now because I am working from home and I would hate for anyone to know how many times I open and close my fridge in a day. <laughs> and I'm glad I don't have scales <laughs> as well. <laughs> Anyways. Thank you again so much for joining us tonight and for spending some extra time answering those questions. That's fabulous. I have put my email address um, to the one person that was interested in collaborating with you um, so that they can reach out to me and I can pass um, information over to you. I've also put um, the program development uh, email in the chat. So it's programs at biblioottawalibrary.ca. If you have any questions um, or you'd like to connect with us after this, please feel free to email us there. Thanks again, Dr. Nofel. That was an amazing presentation. We appreciate it so much. And can I just add that if anyone is interested in participating in research, uh, uh, they have mild cognitive impairment and they would like to volunteer to be part of research, we are always recruiting. Of course, right now our research is on hold because of COVID, but we will be recruiting again shortly on a number of research projects. And of course, we need real people living real lives to, to test our technology. And so if they contact Breer, that'd be wonderful. We're always looking to recruit. Fabulous. Thanks so much. Have a great night, everyone. Take good care. Bye-bye now.